Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Today we're going to go over some machine learning. I'm curious, before I start, how many people here are familiar with deep learning and machine learning? Can I see some hands? Okay. All right, because we're going to have a little bit of time then in the beginning to review for everyone else what deep learning is and how it works and uh, to get everybody up to speed at the same time. So the first thing I'd like to do is say thank you to the people that helped me get to where I am today with machine learning. Uh, it's something that I do, it's just a, a habit, but I like to give thanks to Kunal Patel, Ali Reza Derfun, Abdul Khalid, Laurent Simon, and Jada So. They, they, these guys were great, they're experts in machine learning, and helped me so that I can present this in a way that makes it easy for you to understand today. So today we're going to cover these items here. We're going to quickly go over neural networks, and then we're going to talk about adversarial samples. Uh, some people call it adversarial examples. We're going to talk about membership inference attacks, which basically disclose the privacy of your machine learning models and the training data. We're going to also talk about Trojans and data poisoning, model extraction and stealing, and then finally, direct model manipulation techniques. So let's start with a review of machine learning. And I try to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have a question, you know, throw it out there at any time. Raise your hand. Let me know. And we'll get it answered. So we're going to start with this picture up at the top left. OK, so neural networks came from this idea loosely of what a neuron does. And if you look at that neuron picture with the five neurons, there's a blue line separating the, the body of a neuron. And what that symbolizes is that, is that there's two things that a neuron primarily does. The first is it's connected to other neurons, and it's pulling in the signals. So what it's doing is it's summing all the signals that are coming into it that it's receiving. And then it's got to decide, well, what do I do with this signal? Is it enough where I go, I'm going to pass this signal on to other neurons that I'm connected to, or is it not enough where, you know, I'm just going to ignore it? So when you look at the picture below it, that's kind of a more of a, a not a biological representation. And again, it's taking the inputs, summing them together, taking it and passing it out as an output further on. If you take that dot and you look at the top right, that's essentially what you can imagine as being a neuron body. There are two things that that neuron does. Can anyone tell me what the two things are again? Summing and, and passing on, activation output, exactly. But when we look at a neuron in a neural network, the way it sums is not just an additive process. It is taking the input as a number, multiplying it by the weight that it's connected to, and that's the first number that's added with the other input times its weight plus 1, which is the bias, times its bias weight. You add those all together, and you get the sum. So if you look at the very top, that's the formulaic version of what I just explained, which is basically I1 times W1 plus I2 times W2 plus 1 times B1. So I1 and I2 are your inputs to the neural network. And they're the numeric representation of the features that you want to pass into your neural network as inputs to then produce an output. Okay? And the W's and the B's are your weights and biases, which are what is learned from the inputs to the outputs by the neural network. So does everyone understand the summation formula, how it's produced, and how forma formulaically it works? Does everybody understand with that sum how it's derived? Can I get some hands in the air for people who, okay. Um, how about people who don't understand? Okay, good. All right, so the next step 
in a neuron, we have two parts. Is the first is a sum. The second is what we call an activation output function. And what it does is it creates nonlinearity because all we have is a linear operation. And if we didn't have this, then all you could approximate is basically a line or what they call in multiple dimensions a hyperplane. So what we do is we pass that output of the sum to the input of an activation function, and then that becomes our input to the next layer. So you see the W3 and W4? Those are what A out is multiplied with when you're trying to sum up for the next layer. And so I wish I had a laser pointer here, but let's take a look at this example here on the left, okay? To kind of tie it together real quick. So this pretend is a housing price estimator. We have two inputs, which are the number of bedrooms and the number of bathrooms. Okay, so we have one bedroom, one bathroom. It's a pretty small house. And our weights initially are 0 0.8, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.9, 0 0.5. Does everyone see that? Our weights are our connections, and those are the values. So can anyone tell me if you were to calculate the sum of that first hidden node at the top, in the middle, what's the value that you should be able to calculate? Anyone know? What do we do? We take the input times the weight plus the other input times the weight it's connected to to get what? Can anyone tell me? One. So it's one times 0.8, which is what? 0.8 plus 1 times 0.2, which is what? 0.2. So you take 0.8 and 0.2, what do you get? 1, right? So that's why we see a little 1 at the top there. Now what we're doing, you don't see here, is we're running 1 through our activation output function, which is sigmoid. So if you look here at this chart, sigmoid as our activation function, if we're going to say it's 1, we're going to start here at 1, and we're going to go up to the red line, which is sigmoid. And we're going to look at the y-axis across what is the value of y at 1. That's right, 0 0.73. OK? Very good. So what about the middle hidden layer node? If you were to calculate the sum for that node, what would you get? 1.3. But why would we get that? Because what? 1 times what? Right. 0.4 plus 0.9 equals 1.3. Right? OK, very good. Now, if we take 1.3, we push it over here to our sigmoid. We're going to go about right here. And you go up. What is the value of the red line on the y-axis? It is? Point, yeah, point, point zero 0.08, <laughs> but here it says 0.9, but that's good, that's good. Okay, so, so that's what the network is doing. Now, it's doing this to produce these outputs, and guess what? This 0.73 becomes our what for the next layer? It's multiplied by what? Point. So to calculate the last node in our output, we're taking 0.73 and we're multiplying it by what? 0.3. And we're taking 0.79 and we're multiplying it by what? 0.5. And we're taking 0.69 and multiplying it by 0.9. And when we add them together, we get 1.2. And then when we run that through our sigmoid function, we get an output of 0.77 cents for our house price for one bedroom, one bathroom. That's really bad, right? That's not really doing a good job of predicting a house price in Silicon Valley. I know that for sure. So what's, what's going to happen? What does the neural network need to do? Remember what I said. The weights and the biases are what is learned in the neural network. So what needs to happen to the weights and the biases in our neural network? They need to go in what direction? Up. That's right. They need to go up significantly. So what we're going to do is we're going to 
basically calculate an error, and then we're going to take a partial derivative of the error with respect to each of the weights to find out each weight's contribution to the error. And then we're going to update our w's, and we're going to pick an individual w, and we're going to say that w, the new w, is equal to the old w minus alpha, which is some arbitrary learning rate, like 0.1, times the partial derivative of the error with respect to that weight. Now, normally that partial derivative moves the error in the positive direction. That's why we negate it and move it in the negative direction. So what you'll find is that this will be uh, negative minus a negative will make it a positive, and then you're going to add to w, and then all your w's will go up, and they'll go up tremendously. Like you'll see when you, when you pass this training data through, and the actual price is 900,000, then when you calculate that partial derivative, each of these w, the, the partial derivative will be like 10,000 or uh, 100,000. And so each of these weights will be upped. And then the next time through, when you run your um, bedroom and bathroom through the neural network, since the weights are up, it'll give you a prediction that's closer to the real value. OK, so does everybody understand how the network learns? I mean, I gave you a, <laughs> I gave you a very quick, like super fast. Most people are going to explain this in like <laughs> three weeks. But conceptually, you have to understand this to understand what I'm going to explain further. Okay, so that's how a ne neural network learns, is that you give it a bunch of training data, it figures out the error in the model's prediction, it corrects the Ws to make the prediction closer in line to the real value, and it corrects. So you can have millions of records of training data going through, and it's going to update those Ws every time. OK, does everybody understand that? OK, good, good. All right. So you just learned <laughs> deep learning in like five minutes, which uh, my friends told me was impossible to do. Um, all right, so let's, let's focus on adversarial inputs. So these two pictures are actually different. Can anyone see the difference? No, you can't. But a neural network, because it looks at every single pixel value, it sees every minute change from the left to the right. And what happens here is you give that picture on the left to an, a neural network, and it goes, yeah, it's a cat, tabby cat. 88%, I believe it's a tabby cat. But you give this other picture that's been perturbed to the neural network, and it goes, 99%, I think it's guacamole. Now, that's a problem, right? And when you look at this, you ask yourself, well, you know, okay, so there's some, you know, image, you know, cat can be guacamole, big deal, right? But let me ask you, what do you think is attackable with adversarial samples? Based just on this drawing. And this isn't even complete. This is just part of the papers discussing what you can attack with adversarial samples. And so let's, let's look at it. You got reinforcement learning, you got generative modeling, face, that's images, another object detection images, semantic segmentation, that's a type of outlining, you know, what's in this image, you know, what are the different parts, reading comprehension, malware detection. What would you say is attackable with adversarial samples? Just guess. Pretty much everything. Everything. Because, and, and you ask yourself why. Well, let's go back to this picture here. Um, in this neural network, do you see any discernment? You know, they call it AI, artificial intelligence. But do you see any intelligence in that? I mean, it, it does learn, and it does find patterns. But when you give it something, what does it essentially do? It just takes those numbers, and it just does what? Well, yeah, it creates a network, and it just takes it, and it does a mathematical set of chained operations. That's it. It doesn't think. It doesn't reason. It doesn't try to understand what you're giving it. It just goes, okay, you know what? I've got these weights that I've learned from looking at all, the, all this data. 
and I'm just going to churn through and give you an output. That's it. So pretty much everything is attackable with adversarial samples. Now, why is this important? Some of you might be familiar with uh, web applications. If you know, a web application has a coding vulnerability inside of it, you can see it. You can find it. You can fix it. But in a machine learning model, where's the code? I mean, you saw that, right? What, where's the code in the neural network? Is there? Well, there's, okay, the code basically sets up that neural network, and it learns those numbers. And then every time you get an input, churn, right? Plug and chug, that's it. That's all the code does, is set up. And then set up the weights, learn the weights, boom, done. Deploy it, run the inputs through the network, get an output. Okay, so what that means is every darn machine learning model is pretty much vulnerable to this, okay? I mean, pretty much every machine learning model. Um, so you can think of it as your web applications having a SQL injection or a parameter tampering by default in them. Essentially, it's a parameter tampering, right? You can tamper with the input until you get your desired output. All right. So how does this work? Well, there's, there's two primary things you've got to keep in mind, right? Um, one is that when you're dealing with a neural network, you're not dealing with that small neural network that I showed you, dealing with this large neural network that has like 50 or 100 nodes in each layer. And you can have 100 nodes, uh, layers across. You have millions of connections, sometimes billions, I think, in the more recent um, models. So. When you have your inputs, you can either have a situation where basically you take each input and you modify it just a little bit, right, in the correct direction to cause the output to produce a false output because of the fact that in aggregate, when you take a small change and you move it across all the pixels, it becomes a big change when you multiply it through the network, right? The other option is you can take the very sensitive inputs that when you take the partial derivative of and you find which inputs affect the output the most, you focus on those and you change those stronger. And then because those influence the output strongly, you get a change in the output as well. So there's two techniques. Modify everything just a little. You can't see it or you modify the key things a lot, where maybe you might see it, but most people go, that looks a little funny, but you know, it's still a cat, right? All right, and, and the thing is, the way the neur neural network generalizes is different from the human brain, right? We didn't see the difference between those two pictures. But a neural network will see every single minute detail that you give it. All right, so when we, when we take a look at what the overall process is for adversarial attack, basically, if you look at this neural network, we just have a bunch of inputs, a bunch of connections, and this is a small neural network, right? Like I told you, there's networks that have 50 to 100 nodes in one layer, and you have hundreds of no layers across. So think about how many connections you have that are learning values from your training data. Okay, so this is just kind of a picture of a little bit more. You have your inputs, you have your outputs. And just so you understand, remember that the inputs always have to be numbers. And this is a fully connected layer from the inputs to the first hidden node. So all these Blue nodes in the center, they're called your hidden layer. And the first layer is your input layer. Your last layer is your output layer. And in your output layer, 
you could have different things, like the first node could be, is it a cat, is it a dog, is it a bird, is it a plane? So there'll be four nodes, and the way that you would know what the model's predicting is that when you passed in your input, whatever was the highest value in the output, that would be what the model is predicting if it was doing a classification. Okay, does everybody understand that? All right, great. All right, so there's two primary techniques when an attacker is going to be attacking your machine learning models. Okay, one is white box and one is black box. So people who are familiar with white box and black box, can anyone describe to me what white box means versus black box, you know, if you're attacking? Yes. Very good answer, yes. So white box, just to, for everyone else's... Uh, hearing that white box is when you have the internal details of the machine learning model and you may have access to the training data so typically this is going to be done by a insider but there is a case where you may have access to the model but you don't have access to the data does anyone know when that situation occurs with machine learning well okay public apis that's one that's good what about model zoos or model exchanges, right? Where basically, you, you know, a lot of people will take an existing model that's been trained and then use transfer learning to customize that model for their domain and basically take a model from some zoo or some uh, model exchange and then use it. But they don't know what's really been done with that model. So... That would be kind of a gray box where you don't have access to the training data, or, or maybe you could get the training data because they'll say, we used this as our training data. But that's white box. How about black box? Anyone? If white box means you got access to everything, what does black box mean? Yeah, you don't have access, exactly. You don't have access, you just have access to the, basically the API, right? Where basically you can give it data and get the response. You don't have access to the model, you don't have access to the training data, just, it just might be an API. All right, so the key thing when you're looking at adversarial attacks is that you're looking at differentials. So we talked about the differential that is the, der the derivative of the error with respect to the weights to understand what each weight's contribution to the error was so that we could correct the weights, right? And so that the model can learn. But if you're an attacker, then what differential are you looking at? Are you looking at the derivative of the error with respect to the weights? Or what does an attacker have control over? It's a derivative of the error with respect to the what? So, so this is the formula that we had before where we were updating it. But, but here, in this case, when we're updating the model, we're the machine learning developer, and we're trying to make the model work better. But as an attacker, what do we have access to in this picture? What can we – yes, someone said it, the input. We can manipulate the input. So then what does that mean about the derivative that we want? We want the derivative of the error with respect to Yes. So basically we want the derivative of the error with respect to the input because that's what we as attackers can manipulate, right? And if we know which inputs are sensitive to the machine learning model, then there is the weakness that's going to lie. And that's what the attacker is going to focus on. So we're looking at the, the differential between the error and the input. And instead of gradient descent, which is what we did to make the error smaller, we're going to do what? Gradient Yes, ascent, maximize, yes. We're going to do gradient ascent. So we want to increase the error to cause the machine learning model 
to produce an output that we want that is not correct. And that's why we use gradient ascent, okay? All right, when we take a look at the primary techniques for adversarial samples, they fall into three general techniques, and they're tied to what we talked about before. The first is something called fast gradient sign method. And basically, it's where you take every single pixel and you find the gradient or the differential of the error with respect to the input pixel for every single pixel. And we're going to find the direction that moves it in the positive direction. And instead of moving it in the negative direction like we did with the Ws, we're going to move, move it in the positive direction to do what? Increase the, that's right, the error. And when we increase the error, it will cause the output to change to what we want. But at the same time, we don't want to modify every single pixel a lot because what happens to the picture or to the input? If we change it a lot, when you look at it, what's going to happen? That's right. You're going to be able to see that the picture is messed up. Oh, and that y that's been perturbed. Yes, question. Yes, good question. So there are targeted attacks and there are untargeted attacks. So if you just arbitrarily move the error up, you don't know what the output target's going to be. So there are ways of doing targeted attacks, which we're going to come to, by creating what they call a Jacobian saliency map, where you basically, and I'll explain it, but yes, we're going to get to that. So that's a very good question, and it's great that you're seeing ahead. But I want you to understand the principles behind it before we start doing this. So the first is fast gradient. You take every single pixel, you find out the derivative of the error with respect to that pixel, and you move it in the direction that increasing the error just a little bit. But in aggregate, when you tie them all together, they, they result in a great change in the output. Okay? The, the next is the Jacobian saliency map approach, where basically we're taking the derivative and we're trying to find those pixels that affect either the target class the most and the other targets the least, and just you know, zing those pixels, okay? And, and twi twist them a little bit more than you would in fast gradient sign method. So they may, those pixels may stand out a little bit more, but you're gonna gradually increase them and hope that they don't. And then finally, we have something called the Carlini and Wagner uh, min-max loss function, which basically is an optimization technique to basically look for images that are very close, but then also uh, adversarial inputs where the target is the greatest and the second target, second closest target is a certain distance away. And we'll, we'll get to the details on that. And then finally, um, we have non-gradient based techniques like genetic algorithms, hill climbing, and GANs. So before we go into detail on these um, attack methods. And one thing you're going to have to do when you get into machine learning and security is you're going to have to start to love math because everything you read in machine learning is related to math. That's how they describe it. That's how they explain it. All the security papers, they're math. So if you've been avoiding it, um, you know, you got to now get back to it. All your linear algebra, calculus, Differential equations, all that wonderful stuff you're gonna have to get back to. Uh, matrix, you know, um, operations. So I wanna quickly go over what these are because we're gonna be talking about them in when we get into details about these different attack te techniques. So we have the L2 distance, and what this is is measuring the original input to the perturbed input. Okay? So if I have an original picture and I have a perturbed picture, an L0 measurement of the distance between those two pictures is basically just saying, how many of the pixels did you change? That's what an L0 distance means. So if you see a paper and it's talking about, oh, we created this adversarial sample and we use the L0 distance, that's all it means. It's the number of pixels that were changed, okay? L1 is basically the sum of all the differences between each of the pixels in the original and the adversarial pixel, okay? So that's what sum is. And then we have our standard Euclidean distance, 
which is basically taking the difference of every single pixel, squaring it, adding them all together, and then taking the square root. Okay, so that, that, that one you might remember from uh, college. And uh, then we have the LP distance, which is basically taking it everything to the pth power, the difference, adding them up, and then taking the pth root. And then we have the infinite, L infinite distance, which basically looks at all of the changes and says, what is the maximum change in any one of the pixels in the original to the perturbed? Okay, so it doesn't matter if every single pixel is modified by one value, one unit value, and then the very last pixel is modified by five, the L infinite distance is what? Five, okay? So everybody got that? Good, all right. So let's go into a little bit more detail about the fast gradient sign method. So this is the formulaic representation of that. So when we create our adversarial input, which X, when you see these papers, is tr traditionally representing what your input to the neural network is, okay? And ADV means adversarial. It's gonna equal basically the original input plus some epsilon. So epsilon is just a constant, and basically there's a budget that you have when you perturb these images. So they, they try to keep the perturbations in these images to a certain limit, and epsilon is just kind of like this step. We're gonna say, okay, epsilon, we're gonna try to perturb this image, and we're gonna say epsilon is 0 0.001 or 0.1 or whatever, and we're gonna multiply basically the sign of what we talked about, the derivative of the loss with respect to our input. Does everyone see that? I know that J um, is kind of confusing, but what that means is what is the loss of the function, and the X means with respect to X. So here, we're just taking the sign of that gradient, and because it's in the positive direction, we're then multiplying that by epsilon and adding it to every single pixel. Okay? Anyone got any questions on this? So this is fast gradient sign method. I explained it to you conceptually, but this is the formulaic representation of it. Any questions? Okay. Does, does everyone understand how fast gradient sign method works? I, I know this mathematical stuff is kind of like, okay, great, but does everyone see that what we're doing is basically adding a certain small amount to every single pixel, because X represents your input, which is, which is a picture, but the direction that we push each pixel is dependent on the gradient's sign. So if that pixel is something that positively affects the error in the positive direction, we're gonna move the pixel which way? Is it gonna move up or down? Up. And if, if the pixel is something that negatively affects the error, then we want to push it down, right? I mean, well, the, if, if the negative, the more you make it negative, the more it increases the error, then you're going to push it down, right? So that's all this is saying. Okay, we're going to go now to your question. So the Jacobian saliency map approach basically builds this table up in the top right. Okay, and if you look at it, the capital F1 to capital F dot 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 down M is your different classes. So if we had cat, dog, bird, plane as our four classes that the neural network could classify, how many rows would we have? Because each F, capital F, counts for a class. And if we have four, how many rows would we have? Four, exactly. And each of those rows would represent one class. Now, if you look at the bottom portion, X, what did we say X was? X always represents what? The input, good. And if we have X1 through XN, if we have a picture, and it's a nine by nine picture, how many columns are we gonna have? 81, right, because we have a pixel for every single value of our nine by nine, which is 81 pixels, we go across 81. 
Okay? So this thing is basically telling us which pixel is tied to which class or affects the class the most. Okay? Does everyone see that? So this is your question about, you know, how do we know which pixel to modify to push it in the direction of a particular class? Well, this table tells you that exact thing. Okay? So now what they do is they create two different sub-tables to figure out which pixels to modify. In the first table, they're going to figure out which pixel inputs increase the probability of a particular target class. So what they're going to do is this is where the targeted attack is. They're going to create this table, and if the derivative with respect to the class, I mean, sorry, of the class with respect to the input is less than zero. That means it's negative. So does that mean we want to use that pixel if we want to push it in the direction of the target class? Does anyone know? If it's a negative gradient and we're trying to push the value in the direction of the target class, and if it's negative, do we want to use that pixel? No, someone shake their head. No, Groot, good. And that's correct. We don't. That's why it's zero, right? We want to pick the pixels that move the class in the direction, in the positive direction, to increase the likelihood that if we modify that pixel, we're going to create on the output the desired target. Okay? So if it's negative, we surely don't want that. But also, if j does not equal t there. You see that right there? So j is just some arbitrary t other class. So in our example, we had cat, bird, dog, plane, right? So if we're trying to move a picture of a cat to a plane, then plane is our target. And j is all the other classes. OK? Does everybody see that? OK, so we're going to take the sum. And if those values are greater than 0, then what is that doing? What does that mean if I increase that pixel? Is it helping me to push the output toward the target? If the other classes, if the gradient is positive for that pixel, is it helping me? No, it's not. Because these are the other targets. I want to I wanna push it to plane, but this is looking at J, which is not plane. Plane is T. That's the target. We want to push toward plane. But J does not equal T, so that means it's bird, cat, bird, cat, dog. And if those are positive for that pixel, then I don't want to use that pixel because it doesn't move me in the direction that I want to go. Everybody got that? OK. So in the other case, then if the, the, the uh, derivative of the target with respect to that input pixel is positive and the other classes are, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. The, so if, if uh, the top part is good, then we take the derivative of that and we multiply it by the absolute value of the sum of the other classes, okay? And that becomes our value. And we build up this table like that, and we're going to find the biggest positive values in that table, and what are we going to do with those pixels? They become our what? That, they become our target for modifying. Exactly. So we pick the biggest values in that table associated with the pixels, and that allows us to modify the pixels that push us in the direction of the desired target. Does everyone understand that? Great. Okay, now, the bottom is just the opposite. So the top table was figuring out how to modify the pixels in the positive direction. The bottom table basically tells you what pixels you need to decrease to increase the likelihood of pushing the output toward your target class. Okay, so it's just kind of the reverse, but you're looking at how you're changing the pixels in the negative direction or picking which pixels that you can reduce that will increase the likelihood of that target being classified, I mean, that picture being classified as a target. Everybody understand that? Okay.
All right, so Carlini and Wagner are really the, the awesome um, people in this field. And they basically broke all of the defenses. I mean, and literally, like, a defense would come out, a paper would come out, we got a defense. We protect against adversarial samples. And literally, like, three days later, they'd say, uh-huh, no, you don't. And they'd write a paper and just, you know, show them um, and break them. And the, the thing they used to break all the defenses was basically this, uh, or a slight modification of this to generate their adversarial samples. So if you look at the formula, it's a min-max optimization problem. So they're minimizing the x prime. x prime, can anyone tell me what they think x prime is in x? So x is our what? Input. x prime would be, yes, the modified input, which is our adversarial candidate, right? So they want to minimize that distance. So that notation there is basically saying the squared L2 norm distance. And we talked about that, the L2 no uh, distance. So they're trying to minimize the difference between those two, the adversarial image and the original it's squared, plus C, which is some constant, times L, right? Uh, L of the adversarial input. And so L of the adversarial input is this max, max function, where basically they're taking the max of Z. Now Z, when you look at it in a lot of papers, what Z is basically is the logits layer. So it's the layer before the softmax, where you have the raw outputs. And what they're doing is they're saying, take those values that are coming out of that layer, and when you pass the adversarial input to it, I want you to get the max class, and make sure that, and, and this is actually not, oh, okay, so the first half of that on the left side is the class, the second most predominant class, because it says i not equal to j. So, uh, sorry, t. t is our what? Target. i is some class that's not equal to the target, but is the max that's not equal to the target. Okay? So, and then we're saying, take that second closest value of the class closest to the target, subtract it with the target, see that z of x prime with the adversary, and the difference should be at least k, okay? So we're, we're basically saying create this adversarial sample, this input, where when you perturb it, the second closest class is a certain distance away, and then everything else is, is further away, okay? So it's, it's creating this, this separation between the target class and the second closest class, so it kind of like pushes the target class up where it's standing head and shoulders above everything else, and it's going to be picked, all right? And so they, did, they, um, they have this function, and they create adversarial examples with it and just wrecked everybody. So, uh, so for review, I want to see if, if you're learning. Um, so how do we go about identifying inputs with the greatest impact on the loss function for a targeted class. Anyone know? How do you calculate this? What do we need to use at a high level? What have we been talking about? The, I'm sorry? Um, you mean like uh, the uh, differentials? It's kind of related to a differential. What do we need to calculate? The derivative of the error with respect to the inputs, remember? That's going to tell us which pixel to modify. And what do you do next? Does anyone want to know? Yes, yes, exactly. So remember the uh, Jacobian? We basically have to calculate that table, right, of the classes, with respect to the inputs, and then we know which to focus on, right? And then basically, we move the output in the direction, I mean, we, we figure out which pixels to move up, which pixels to move down, 
and keep on increasing the value until basically we get our target output that we want from the neural network. Okay? Take steps, and that's it. All right. So what do you do when you can't take gradients easily? Does anyone know? If you can't take gradients, if you can't calculate a partial derivative of the error with respect to the input, um, does anyone know what other techniques you can use? We kind of alluded on them in the beginning quickly, but does, uh, basically we have genetic algorithms, we have hill climbing, and we have generative adversarial networks. Does anyone know what genetic algorithms are? Can anyone explain to me how a genetic algorithm works or how we would try uh, how how it works in general? Um, okay. Yes, yes, but it's like basically how people reproduce in real life, right? You start with a bunch of parents, you have a fitness function to determine if the offspring are improving. You, and, and you randomly create uh, genetic, uh, what's it called, features in the parents. And you, you create a bunch of parents and you have them randomly um, mate. They combine their features. You, you also mutate because when uh, features come together, there's always some type of mutation. And you evaluate the offspring through the fitness function. And you basically say, okay, which offsprings are going to produce more children? And... Um, that's essentially what you're doing when you're creating these adversarial inputs. You start out with a bunch of candidate inputs, you mate them, you cross the, you know, the, the features, and then assess how well the, the adversarial input's functioning. Um, you have ra random mutations, and then uh, you repeat the process until basically nothing changes, right? For your hill climbing, Basically, you're starting at some random point, and then you're increasing the error. And finally, with GANs, you can use them to generate adversarial samples as well if you train them. All right. So let's talk about black box. This one is a little bit more interesting. So in black box, you don't have the gradients per se. Okay, But you have a situation where if you have training data, you can create a model that mimics the model you're trying to attack, you can create adversarial samples on the model that you created that mimics the target model you're attacking. And as long as you're training your model with similar data to the model that you're attacking, it learns similar features. And the adversarial samples that you create on your own model transfer to the target. So there is a principle of transferability, which is in adversarial samples. So if, when you're looking at it, the plan of attack of a black box attack is basically based on training data. Do you have it or not? If you have sufficient training data, well, you train your own model, you create your adversarial samples, and you transfer them. And they tend to work on the victim network or victim model. If you don't have uh, training data, then you can synthesize your own training data from the target model. So you're going to pass this random data to the model. You're going to get an output as a label. You're going to use that to train your model. You're going to update the pixels in the direction that move this random synthesized data toward a particular class. Then you're going to give it back to the attacked model, it's going to produce a label and it's going to keep on, you're going to iterate this process until this data essentially represents kind of an average of all of the data in that targeted model's system. Okay, and then um, create adversarial samples on your model, transfer them, and they're going to work on the victim model. So, we kind of covered this in a particular, um, at, at basically a high level. Um, so what we're going to do is let's, let's talk about 
uh, one of the ways of synthesizing data to give you a little bit more insight in that, because it sounds kind of magical, right? Um, I can just make data, and from the a model I'm attacking, that seems kind of, you know, uh, I have a hard time believing you, um, you know? So um, let's talk about the process a little bit more in detail. So if you're trying to copy a model, you're gonna start with your own model, and if you know that they're using like a, a certain model, they got it from a model zoo, or they got it from a, a model exchange, then you start with a model that's very similar. And you train on a similar da uh, data set. But then what you can do is you can start creating and manufacturing your own data set by using this te technique, which was highlighted in this paper here, where basically you take your input and you modify it by taking the sign of the output class of what you pass this input to the target model as with respect to the input. And then you can basically modify the input to move that input in the direction of the target class on your system. And then you add that to your existing training data. So it kind of multiplies. And it gets better over time. And basically, the other thing you have to be uh, mindful of is that there are certain things like uh, this lambda p should flip between positive and negative values periodically. It's in the paper, and there's also something called reservoir sampling to reduce the number of queries that you have to do on the target model. So basically, you have to make a bunch of queries on the model you're attacking. So that's going to give you away, right? But you can use techniques like reservoir sampling to try to limit the amount of queries that you have to do in this whole process of training your model and getting training data from the, the, the model you're attacking. Okay? So let's talk about adversarial patches. So an adversarial patch is basically a dominant marker that kind of represents all of the, the data for a particular class. And this is something that only works with single object classifiers. Does anyone know what a single object classifier is? in comparison to a multi-object classifier. If I give you a picture and it has multiple things in it, a multi-class multi classifier is going to do what? It's going to look at every single thing and do what? That's right. It's going to draw boxes around every single thing and say, this is a person, this is a plant, this is a whatever. But a sing single object classifier is going to just look at a picture and do what? It's going to produce one what? One output classification. So this adversarial patch technique only works with that. But let's look at an example of how it works. So here in the upper picture, you have a picture of a what? A banana, right. But when you throw that patch in, what, what does the neural network say it is? Toaster, right. Now, <laughs> You think about that and you go, whoa, wait a second, that patch is so much smaller than the banana. Why would that patch suddenly make this output say it's a toaster? Why would it make the neural network say it's a toaster? Does anyone have any intuition? Yes, good. Okay, so it is in the center, that's true, that's a good point. But a neural network, uh, uh, typically a, a CNN, does something called convolution, where it's taking it's not looking at the whole picture at once, it's taking kind of um, these blocks and then going across and looking at you know, segments of them. So technically, being in the center shouldn't affect it that much. But a good intuition, what do you notice about the patch? I'm, it's not, that's true, it's not yellow. Uh, I'm sorry? The patch, what, what is special about the patch? First of all, what is the classifier saying the picture is? Toaster, right. But what? look in that patch. What do you see in that patch? Well, okay, metal. What are toasters made of? Metal, right? They're kind of shiny like that. What else do you kind of see in that picture of the patch? The slots. That's right, the slots. What else? That's right, very non-yellow, very true. Okay, but 
But how does a neural network train a single object classifier? What do you give it? You give it pictures, right? And you give it pictures of things, and you say, this whole thing is a toaster. This whole thing is a banana. This whole thing is a bird or whatever. So when you look at the pictures that the toasters, I mean, the pictures of the training data that were used to train toasters, what do you think were in the background? Kitchen, yes. And what is inside of a kitchen? I'm sorry? <laughs> there's a banana. Sometimes there's bananas, that's true. But in this particular picture in the toasters, there probably wasn't banana. There was what? What does that green thing look like? What, what do a lot of people like to put in their food when they make it fresh? Herbs, right. And what else is in a picture of a toaster usually? I mean, they have some red thing down there, but it's like the potatoes or something, you know, the red potatoes or something. And, um, you know, like there's some kind of pot or something. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is when you're, <laughs> when you're training a neural network, you're giving it this big picture of a toaster. But there's a lot of stuff in the background, right? And so you're telling the neural network this whole thing is a toaster. So it's going, oh, okay, this is a toaster. Well, there's green stuff, that's a toaster. And there's a potato, that's a toaster. And there's a silver thing with slots on it, that's a toaster, right? So what this patch essentially does is basically take, in essence, all the things that were salient or that were distinguishing in the pictures of the labeled toasters and putting them all into a unique, compact, tight little patch where when the neural network sees it, because it's taking these small pictures across, and when it gets to the patch, it's going across and it's going ding, ding, ding. You know, everything's saying toaster, 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 right? So that's another thing you got to keep in mind is that when you're training your models, what you have in your training data affects what your model thinks is the output. Okay? Everybody got that? Okay, and that's, that's, that's why it works. But now I want to see if you're thinking and understanding these principles. So if, if you were to create an adversarial patch, how do you think you would do it? We talked about, you know, getting the partial derivatives of the error with respect to the input. So let me help you with the starter, okay? Let me help you with the starter. So the, the first start is we need the, the gradients, but what we're going to do is we're going to start with some random Gaussian distributed patch, okay? And we're going to stick it on the image, and then we're going to do what? We're going to calculate the gradients or the derivatives of that, those patch pixels with respect to the what? With the input, and we want it the target, right? We want to hit the target, which is toaster. So we want to find out in that patch, in that random Gaussian noise shaped like a patch, which of the pixels will move if I change the pixel value, the output of the model to toaster, right? And so, yes? So uh, that's a good idea, but it's, it's something where basically you have to you, you can't tell the neural network, you know, pushing it backwards to output a picture. Um, you have to basically understand from taking the derivative of the uh, target class with respect to the input, which of the pixels are going to push the output of the classification toward toaster. And then you're going to only modify those pixels. And you're just going to keep on making changes. So. Basically, um, exactly, exactly. So basically, if you had a model that did single object classification, you could do this. You could basically start with some area, a random set of noise, 
and then you could calculate, if you want you know, to create your own toaster patch, the derivative of the output of toaster with respect to each pixel, and just like we did with the Jac J Jacobian saliency map, and figure out which pixel to move up and which pixel to move down. And then as you change it and you run it through, you're going to see the classification start rising for toaster. You know, at first it'll be point, you know, whatever percent. And as you increase these pixels, then toaster output probability is going to go up. And that's what you're trying to do. You're, you're iteratively going through. But, but the other thing you want this patch to be d done is to, to be recognized anywhere on the screen. So what is the next step? So you start with the patch, and you create a patch that's kind of strong that moves it into toaster. But you also want this patch to work anywhere on the screen, right? So what do you need to do now? Okay, that's, that's moving in the direction that's the correct direction. What you're going to do is you're going to take that patch, you're going to move it all over the screen, and then you're going to rotate it in different ways and orientations so that it works no matter which orientation you put it in, no matter if you put it in the top left, bottom corner, whatever, it's going to work. So you basically got to train it and keep on refining that patch so that it works in any orientation, it works in any part of the screen, and you keep on taking the derivative with respect to that patch, and then you can make the patch. All right, does everybody understand that? All right. Um, let's talk about defenses. So, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, Carlini and Wagner basically are the cause of a lot of these being striked out. Um, Basically, their technique um, made all these defenses that we thought were possible actually uh, that broke them. And uh, one of the other things is adversarial training, where you actually take your training data and you create adversarial samples of it, and then you train the model to recognize it correctly instead of as the wrong thing. Well, another problem you have is what they call membership inference attacks. So by creating more training data, you increase the likelihood of disclosing private information. So I know here in Europe, um, that's a big thing with GDPR. Uh, the other thing is to use a simpler model and learn class conditional distributions, um, maybe incorporate model confidence. And the key thing is, rate limit your API. So, you know, one of the things we talked about is when you're atta being attacked, they're going to make many calls to your API to try to create synthetic data to basically mimic your model and create adversarial samples to attack you. So if you're rate limiting your API and you're monitoring it, then you can hopefully identify when someone is trying to use these techniques against your machine learning models. All right? But let's, let's talk about, um, oh, let's do an uh, apply your knowledge, okay? So um, this question is kind of trying to stretch your brain a little bit. Now, now that you understand these ideas, what I want you to do is take this idea, adversarial samples with images, and apply them to text, okay? So in text, like you look at some text, like an email, text body, and you say, is it spam or is it not? So with an adversarial input, what we're trying to do is modify something that was previously categorized as spam and turn it into not spam by modifying it. So let me ask you this. If you were to do that, how do you think you would do that using adversarial techniques? Anyone have any ideas? That is true. Okay, so yes, yes, uh, very good. Uh, um, good intuition. So I was going to ask what your name is, but um, 
Very, very true. But let me ask you this. So what this gentleman had pointed out, which is correct, is you want to focus on the words that strongly correlate with determining that the text is categorized as spam, right? And just like we, we talked about the images, right? What pixels do we want to modify? We want to modify the pixels that influence what? The output target class, exactly. So how would we find out what words in a spam email were important to the determination of that text being classified as spam? What can we do as a technique to find out these words that are important? I don't know about taking gradient. We might be able to do that, but what's another way? I mean, we're, let's say that we're, giving, we're given an output confidence. You run this text through, and it says spam 97%. You run another text through, you modify it, it says spam 87%. So what do you think you would do to figure out which words are important to the determination of whether or not this text is classified as spam. Anyone have any ideas? Yes. Yes. Okay, you're you're almost there. Actually, it's the reverse. <laughs> but you're 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 close. So who else? Was there another hand? So so basically, what this gentleman was saying was um, that you would add words, and that can be a technique. But the more has anyone heard of a term called ablation? So ablation is when you basically learn about how something works by doing what to it? Take, well, poking. Yeah, it is poking it, but you're taking out different pieces of it, running it, and seeing the result, right? That's what an ablation study is, right? And you're trying to figure out, you know, you've got all these 10 different parts that are causing some output, you take one out, and you see what the output is, you take another thing out, you see what the output is, and you put the other thing back in. All right, so how do we do this with our text to find the most important words? What are we going to do? <laughs> we're going to write an email, and we're going to take out specific words, and then we're going to do what? Run it through the classifier and see what the output percentage is, right? So how do we know a strong word that, that indicates a spam? What Exactly. If we take that word out, we run it through the classifier, and we see, whoa, it went from 97% spam to 80% spam. Ooh, we know that's a word that's important. Now, when we think about adversarial samples, what are we trying to do? We're trying to create an input that looks the same to a human that's different from the original, but that results in a different output when run through the classifier. So what is a technique that we can use with words where basically the meaning of the sentence or the text is the same, but to our neural network, it's going to be different? Yes? Exactly. Exactly. You can use synonyms. And why would synonyms work? Why would synonyms cause a neural network to suddenly change the output classification. Does anyone know? Exactly, because it's how it's trained. If that synonym was not used in the training data for what it learned, what spam was, when it gets converted to the word embedding and then it gets run through, it goes, oh, I don't know, but guess what? I'm doing my mathematical operations. <laughs> this is the output, right? It's going to be spam or not spam. Okay, so that's... Um, Basically, the application. Does everyone understand now adversarial samples? And, um, okay, so I've got 115 minutes left. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we're about to hit membership inference tax. How's everybody doing? Is everybody doing good? Everybody feel like keep on going? All right, let's keep on going then. Um, let me know if, if you need to take a break or anything. Just raise your hand, and, and then we'll take like a five-minute break, and then we'll come back. Um, all right, so membership inference attacks. So this is important because sometimes your training data has sensitive information in it that you don't want to disclose. And sometimes these models basically can tell you whether or not 
training data was used by what input you pass to the model, okay? And or if you, if you have a combination of features and you put them together, you can actually look at a particular set of features and start fiddling just one feature with different values and look at the output classification results and kind of go, oh, this collection of features probably was used as training data. Now, le let me ask intuitively, what do you think that would look like? So how would you basically say, just guess, how would you say, oh, this was used as training data? You know, you pass an input to the model and you get an output. Can anyone tell me intuitively what they think would indicate that a particular input was you yes 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 well I, I don't know if it'd be a hundred percent but very true very it would be very high but how would it be high in comparison to what very good that's the start but there's a little bit more to it so can you elaborate so the gentleman said that when you pass an input you get a high confidence but there's a little bit more to it what else do you have to notice Okay, so, so when you say the other failures, let's talk about it in something that people can see. Let's talk about cat pictures, okay? I know it doesn't matter if, you know, hey, Joe Bob's cat is using this training set. That doesn't really matter, okay? But, but the thing is, it's, it's, it's an example. So what would you say, looking at cat pictures, what would be an indicator that a cat picture was in the training set or not? Like, try to apply it. What would you think you would be seeing? Okay, okay, so, so if you were to take some cat picture and you run it through and you t it comes out like 92%, right? And you take another cat picture and it comes out 92 and it comes out and there's another cat picture, it comes out like 92, you know, in that range, 92, 94, whatever. But then this one cat picture comes out and it's 99.5%, right? And then you take another cat picture and it comes out, oh, 92 to 94, 92, 94, okay. So that's kind of what I'm saying, what it looks like. I mean, that's a simple, it's a gross simplification, but I just want to give you a picture in your mind to understand, okay? Um, so can anyone tell me why knowing if training data was used in your model or leaking this information is important? What kind of uh, application where you have training data that would be sensitive, would it be bad? You know, let's say you're doing this study on sexually transmitted diseases or uh, people with uh, genetic defects, um, anything with health, right? Um, anything that affects your livelihood, right? Um, do you have any, you know, let's say there's this machine learning algorithm, algorithm that looks at your uh, history. You know, were you in prison? Were you uh, ever, uh, you know, had a, committed a felony, uh, I don't know. There might be some other stuff, right? And if that were to leak, that would be really bad, right? Especially if it, they could tie it back to you, right? Um, so when we talk about member, membership inference attacks, you know, we, we got to then think about, well, okay, so you, you told me kind of what, how to look for it, but what is the underlying cause, right? Well, Every deep learning model has this ability to memorize, right? And if you look here, what do you notice about these pictures? These are our training sets. What's, what's kind of weird about this training set? Each word is, is the label associated with the picture. What, what is wrong with this? Well, okay, they're, they're poorly trained, but they're randomized. So what they did was they took pictures and they randomized the labels associated with them. And then they took all these pictures with the labels and they ran them through a neural network just over and over and over and over again. And guess what the neural network did with these pictures? Can anyone tell me? Yes, they memorized all these pictures. When you put back the pictures in to the neural network, it correctly told you the wrong label. 
for every single one of the images that it was trained on. So what that says is that basically these machine learning models and deep learning have an incredible ability to memorize your training data. And typically this occurs when something called overfitting happens in your machine learning model. So if you look at that curve, the blue line is your training error and the red line is your validation. So the way that these work is that you have a training set which you just keep on running through and you keep on updating the weights, remember, that we showed you in that pre uh, previous example. But if you keep on doing it too much, then when you run it on images or information that it hasn't seen, the error goes up. Because it's memorizing your training data instead of generalizing to what the thing should be in a general sense. Okay? So then you think about mem membership inference attacks that leak training data and you go, oh, that kind of makes sense. So what do you think are the enablers of membership inference attacks? Anyone have any idea? We've, we've been kind of talking about it. Overfitting, very good. Overfitting, but also what can contribute to this is outliers in your training data. So the reason why outliers contribute very significantly to your weights is this MSE stands for mean squared error. It's one of the loss functions that's used when you're training a neural network model to try to figure out what that error is when you calculate the derivative of the error with respect to each weight. So can anyone tell me, if I have a big difference, if I have an outlier, that means that the, the y hat or the y tilde and y sub i are going to be varying a lot. So y sub i is the real label or the real value, and the y hat is your outlier. I'm sorry, the, the y hat. Y of I is your outlier, the real value that's way out there. And then you have your prediction, right, which is Y hat. Because you have an outlier, the difference is going to be what? Big, right? And when you square a big number, what happens to it? It becomes even bigger. And then when you take the partial derivative of the error of that with respect to each weight, what happens to the weights? They get corrected even bigger, right? And so that outlier has an effect on all the weights that move it in the direction that is related to that training data. And then we have adversarial training. So with adversarial training, what we're doing is we're taking each one of your inputs and we're applying adversarial perturbations to it and then we're running it through again as the correct label. Well, what do you think that does? Well, it, okay, so it creates robustness. So the model will see a perturbation and go, you know, you're not fooling me. I've seen this before. I've been trained on it. It's a cat. It's not guacamole. Right? But what happens? You, you have all this training data that you've created that says, this picture, which is just slightly different from a cat, and that's not guacamole, is a cat, and you're running it through many, many times. So in effect, it's like overfitting, right? Basically, where you're running through and you're training it over and over again with the same label. And that's how it can memorize your data when you use adversarial training, all right? So essentially, you can't have your cake and eat it too. So, um, you know, this, this slide here is just meant to Talk about different methods. Um, you can use the naive method, which is uh, applying these different adversarial techniques to the images and then training. Um, but then there's also more complicated ones like distributionally robust optimization or utilizing a robust loss, loss function. But all the papers are there if you want to take a look at that. Um, what about defenses? Does anyone know what kind of defense we would use against adversarial, I mean, uh, membership inference attacks. Given that it's related to overfitting, 
what's a solution? Does anyone know? People have experience with machine learning and, and deep learning. What's a fix for overfitting? Anyone remember? Yes. Okay, you could do less features, that's true. What else? I'm sorry? Okay, that could help, yes. But the, the term I'm looking for is how do we reduce overfitting, right? That typically, because that's typically a cause. So one of the ways you can do that is to try to address overfitting. And there are different techniques. You know, as you mentioned, cleaning your data so you don't have the unnecessary outliers. And then you have um, regularization techniques like dropout. And in fact, dropout will help the performance of your model. So there, it doesn't have, you know, regularization usually is this trade-off between accuracy and generalization. But dropout actually can, allows you to have your cake and eat it too. So it gives you regularization and it also improves the performance of your models. Um, the other thing is uh, regularization like L2, L1, regularization, and um, stacked models. So this is another technique from the papers I've ad identified here where each model has a disjoint set of the data that it's trained on, but because they're stacked, as the picture shows there, it's difficult to infer the data from the ensemble's output. Okay, so you're taking individual models, combining them together, and then you're producing an output, but because each model's trained with separate data, and they're all combined, then it's, it's more difficult to, uh, to execute membership inference attacks on those uh, outputs. All right, how are we doing? We've got 103 minutes left. Everybody interested? Everybody want to keep on going? Anyone a bit break? Okay, all right. So what we'll do is let's take a five-minute break. We still have trojaning. Data poisoning and uh, trojaning, data poisoning, and model direct model ma manipulation. So, ten minutes. All right, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. This is gonna be a this is gonna be a rush. Okay, ten minutes. So, please come back. Um, we will continue and uh, wrap up. All right. Um, before I get started with the second half, how is everybody doing? Is there any questions? I want to give people time to take the breath. I've been you know, explaining a lot of information. This is like summarizing, I think, at least somewhere in a round of uh, 70 to 80 papers. So um, are there any questions that people have right now? Yes. Yes. Well, okay, so a picture of a toaster probably wouldn't do it because if you notice in that patch, it was taking all of basically your training data of the picture of the toasters and, and trying to take all the salient features out of all of them and combine them into a single thing. If you just took a picture of a toaster, it would probably fight with the banana. And I don't know. That's a good question, though. We should, you know, I, I would try it just to see. I, I, my, my guess is that it would kind of get confused and go, uh, I think it's like maybe 60% banana, you know, 50, you know, what, 40% toaster or something like that. That's my guess. Okay, yes. Oh, okay. I, I just forgot something. There was a gentleman who asked me to repeat the question. So I have to repeat the question before I go to. So uh, this gentleman's question was if you use just a picture of a toaster and you put it on, then what would happen? And so that's what I was answering. And I'm sorry, yes. That's correct. So the question, oh yeah, sorry. Okay, yes. So when you're attacking a system, exactly. So the question was basically reiterating that the understanding, which is that basically when you're attacking a system, you're changing the inputs and it's only going to affect you. Now, when we talk about data poisoning, that will not be the case. So, so you're jumping ahead, which is good, because that means you're starting to understand things. And um, basically... Uh, that's when what you attack will affect everyone. Okay? All right, any other questions? Okay, 
So let's talk about trojaning neural networks. So this is a little different from the patching, but it's also very similar. So we're basically trying to add our own special signal to be recognized by the neural network so that we can produce an override and output that would be expected. All right? And so, um, and there are three scenarios um, that's basically that you can do trojaning is um, when you have access to the model and the training data, and that would typically be an insider. When you only have access to the neural network model, and that would be typically if you're using a model zoo, you got to be very careful because you don't know if you're getting a trojaned model. And if you only have access to an API, which allows you to provide labeled data. You know, some of these APIs say, send me your data. Send me your labeled data so we can improve our model. All right? And that's the third case. All right? So can anyone tell me why this is important? Why is it important to understand if your model has been Trojan? And, and another word for this is backdoored, right? So where would this be important? Yeah, yeah, fraud detection or, you know, if it's a government entity or if you're doing something that, that's financial, you know, where someone could get an advantage financially, this is important to know. So let me ask you this. Does anyone have any experience in the audience finding back doors in code? No? And no one worked for a bank? I, I was working for a bank, and th that's one of the things that I specialized in. But um, does anyone have an idea of what a back door in code would look like? Yeah, so basically it's like a, a kind of a way to get around the authentication or, you know, the different modules and directly get access to certain features, right? Now, as I explained to you what the deep network looks like, you can easily find a backdoor in code if you go look at the authentic, authentic, authentication, authentication modules and you find this thing that says, if ID equals... Add uh, special admin or debug admin allow, right? And you know something's wrong. But when you look at a neural network, how do you find a backdoor or a Trojan in a bunch of numbers? You can't, right? So let's talk about the techniques in a little bit more detail. So if you have the training data and the model, you're an insider. Well, you can train the model to do whatever you want. You can train it to have a special flag where if they're wearing this pin on their hat, they're walking around, the facial recognition says, system says, no, okay, leave them alone, don't. And you can sell that pin on the black market for $100,000, right? Especially in some countries where... That's how they appre apprehend you, is everywhere is a camera, and you walk around, and then the, the policemen get little notifications, and they just move to your location. Okay, what about the second technique? This is something that actually you may actually run into, okay? Well, you might run into the first one, right? I mean, there, there are some people who, you know, want to protest that, you know, they're using... Uh, AI and machine learning in certain applications that they disagree with, so they could do that, right? Um, but in the second case, does anyone see where this could be applicable to you? Does anyone see where, even if you had good insiders that weren't 
taking advantage of your machine learning models where you could get into trouble with a Trojan network. Does anyone see it? We talked about it a little bit. Right. Basically, the, the zoos, the, the places at the farms, the zoos where you get your models, right? There are a lot of model exchanges where basically somebody posts their model and says, hey, this is the trained BERT model for whatever, or this is the model for Image, ImageNet. And you just download it, right? And you build on it. Okay, and that's what this is talking about. So they've already implanted their Trojan in that model. You download it, use it, and you inherit that Trojan. All right, oops. Sorry, jumped a little bit. Uh, the third one is basically uh, you basically clone the network, generate inputs that heavily influence those network weights, and use data poisoning techniques when they give you an API that says here, allow us to learn by you giving us data. So basically what you do is you create the necessary training data that influences the model, weights strongly to produce the output that you desire. So then you're trojaning the network through their uh, API. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're talking about the second one in detail, all right? So this is where basically you are repackaging the neural network and you're inserting a indicator, that apple sign, that's going to produce your desired output. So there are several steps in here, and the first is selecting that mask, which in this particular example is the apple symbol. And then once you run it through, you're going to notice that certain neurons are excited more, and then you're going to focus on those neurons by basically modifying the input to cause the neurons that you're targeting to reach maximal values and produce the outputs that you want. And then what you have to do is you have to insert your Trojan in the network and not affect the other classifications. So can anyone explain to me what happens if I were to insert and train a neural network with a bad classification, what does it do to all the other classifications? It causes them to do what? I'm sorry? Right, the confidence goes down, right? So when you're repackaging, you have to make sure that the other classifications don't go down, right? So what you're doing then is you're synthesizing data that represents all the other classifications holistically and then running that through with your flag. So what it does is then it keeps the other classifications accuracy from going down. And this kind of basically um, highlights how you create that sample data that represents all of the classes. So you start with some Gaussian noise uh, representation of the classification, and then you run it through, and you're updating the pi pixels that we've been talking about this whole time that push the direction of the output class toward what that image is supposed to represent. So if that image is supposed to re represent um, cat, okay, then what you're going to do is you're going to start out with some picture of a cat that's blurry, and then you're going to run it through, and you're going to calculate the derivative of cat with respect to each input pixel. Then you're going to find out what pixels to twist to move that blurry image further toward cat, and you keep on doing this until you get an image that is 99.99% cat. Now, it won't look like a cat, because what it is in effect is like an average of all of the cat pictures, right? It's, it's not really an average. It's, it's a representation of all of the cat training data, okay? And then once you have that image, you just run it through with your flag and it keeps the accuracy from, in cat from going down. 
And you do this for all of your output classifications. You start with a generic representation that's kind of blurred. You run it through. You calculate the derivatives of that classification with respect to the inputs. You modify those pixels in the direction that move it toward making it stronger toward that class, and you end up with a thousand different representations for the thousand different classes that your model supports. And then, once you do that, you can insert your flag into the model without affecting the other classes. Okay? You just train it together. All right? And that's what this neural packaging basically is saying. And the paper is at the bottom here. Um, and, and basically, um, so that I, I summarized everything that is set up there. Um, we already covered this. Okay. Um, so basically, we need to understand how when we're data poisoning, we're, we're now talking about data poisoning. So data poisoning is where you provide some training data to the model and you corrupt the output. So this is where what you were, your question was referring to. Now, as an attacker, you're not just changing the output for yourself, you're changing it for everyone that is using the model. So when you give it training data, you have to understand what training data is going to affect the weights the most for the output that I want. So can anyone tell me, based upon all the techniques we were talking about, and this one might be a little stretch, okay? How would you figure out what training data you had that affected the class probabilities the most? What's a technique that we've been talking about tonight that you can use to find out the importance of a particular training input to the result of running data through your model for that particular class? Does anyone know? So it, it, it's something that we've been talking about all night, and I'll give you a hint. It's kind of related to the same process that you used when you were attacking a, the spam classifier? Yes, ablation, right. So, so what would you do then? You would, well, okay, almost, almost. So basically, so we have all this training data, right? So you would take one out, train your model, and then run your test, right? And you'd see, oh, when I run my test, the accuracy for all the training set is X. And then, and then I put that back in, and I take another training data out. I train the model, and I run the, the test data through that it hasn't seen. I see the accuracy drops a little bit more, right? And I, t I put that back in. I take another one out, and I run it through, and I go, whoa, this time the accuracy dropped a lot. Well, what does that mean? That means what? This, this training data that I pulled out, this one thing is what? Very important, yes, a very important determinator to that class working successfully. So that training, that particular one that I picked out, for some reason is affecting that class strongly, right? So that's one way. But what's the problem with that? Yeah, it takes a lot of time. It's compute intensive. It takes a lot of time. I'm going to take out one, you know, let's say I've got a, a million images. This is going to take forever, right? So, so basically, um, what you can do is you can approximate the importance of training data by using an a approximation function. And um, these two gentlemen from Stanford uh, did a, a good job in terms of doing that because you're not taking the gradient with respect to the input anymore. You have to, it's like you take it to the input back to the training output, right, to figure out the accuracy. And so it's not an easy thing that you can differentiate. So what, what the, in this paper, they have something called influence functions, which basically you can use to identify which training data is important and which, um, 
which inputs in that training data most contribute to the loss. And if you look at that picture up there, this is what we're trying to do with a data poisoning attack. So if you look at the picture of the dog, you label it with fish, and you add a certain amount of perturbation to it to highly affect the weights for fish. And then what happens is dogs that are now run through the neural network model get labeled as what? Fish. Okay? So that's what data poisoning is. But there's also variations of this. Yes, question. So, so this is, okay, so the question was, if we use transferred learning, then how do we know if, you know, we have data poisoning? And, and actually, so, so the, the tra uh, transferred learning, when you're using transferred learning, the issue that you're worried about is um, trojaning, where basically they've repackaged the model, added their flag to it, and then you're downloading that model and then taking off with transferred learning something like the last layer, the last two layers, and you're replacing it with yours, and you're only updating those last two layers. So it, that would be something that would be kind of interesting because when you use data poisoning, you're specifically targeting certain output classifications, and those won't be there when you use transferred learning because you're chopping off basically that layer, and you're replacing it with your classifications. So whatever whatever um, attacks that they had put in the model, it might be uh, a little interesting to see what the result is. If you're using similar type classifications, it might work. But if you're using totally different classifications, I don't think it's going to work. Good question. OK, so this is a simpler method. And it's a little different. So basically, the formula for it is there. And basically, what it's saying is, F is representing our neural network model. And when we pass an input to it, we get an output, right? And here, we're basically passing the target input. And we have the original. We subtract them, so we get a distance between them of their outputs squared. But then we also have the input directly with the... Um, The base, sorry, the base. So if we're talking about like dogs and these fishes, for example, um, what we have is our clean base. And we're basically trying to find, we're trying to solve this to create a situation where fishes get categorized as dogs. Okay? So it's a little different. Um, but we're trying to keep the input very similar to dog, but still have result on fishes. Okay? Um, it's an interesting paper. There's also another technique where you're blending two of the different classes you're attacking. So... You know, the base might be dog, but the target might be fish. And so we're taking a certain percent of fish and we're adding it to the dog picture. So what's going to happen? Can anyone tell me what, what they think is going to happen if we take a certain amount of the fish pictures, we add it to the dog, and we label it as dog? So what that means is when I look through the images, for the most part, I'm going to see pictures of dogs. But... When I run my neural network, pictures that are fish are going to suddenly be categorized as dogs, right? So, and I just kind of gave it away. I meant to ask you, um, 
So, so that everyone can see that, right? It's, it's kind of hard to see, but the target is fish, and you're taking a certain percent, and then the one minus that percent is the base of what you want it to look like. So I don't know if uh, it might not, this one might not have it very well, but like, I don't know if you can see like inside this dog's nose up here in the center, there's a little bit of a fish and that's what you're doing. So basically when you provide this input to the model, it sees kind of is hallucinating a fish in these dog labels. And so when it gets to a real fish, it goes, hmm, this is a dog, right? Okay. All right. So how do we defend against Trojans and data poisoning? Um, when you have a Trojan network, if your distribution of training data is equal across all of the classes and it's balanced, then when you have errors, they should not be skewed toward a certain class. When you insert that flag into your model, what you're doing is you're creating an additional class that doesn't have an additional label. So you're doubling, in effect, a, class rep a class's representation. So if you see when there are random errors and they're skewed toward a particular class that is of high value class, then that might be an indicator that your model has been Trojaned, okay? Um, but, but that isn't always like perfect because you know with training data, and as we talked about with these influences, we don't know which training data is strongly affecting the output classification. And so even if you have like 100 units each of every class, even that won't be perfect. But um, the other thing is to validate your data. So you know, you're going to have to version it. You're going to have to validate it, hash it, make sure that when you pull it from the source, it hasn't changed. And then utilize influence functions. So you need to basically understand, you know, what training data is influencing which class labels. And when there's a mismatch, when you have a dog that's influencing fish, you know there's a problem. So we're going to talk a little bit about model extraction. So basically, um, actually, this is a little different from what I, oh, all my uh, model extraction. Interesting. Okay. Um, I thought I had created some other slides last night, but they don't look like they're here. Um, Basically, there are a number of ways of stealing your model. And we've been kind of talking about it tonight, right? Does anyone know what we're talking about when we um, we're basically extracting or stealing models? Where how, Does anyone understand how we would go about this? How would we go about stealing someone's model on the internet? What are the requirements? Can anyone tell me? So we talked a little bit about this when we were talking about creating black box adversarial samples, does anyone have an idea of how we would basically extract someone's model or steal someone's model? What is the requirement? What do we need for them to provide? Access, yeah, an API, right? An API where basically we can give some input and get an output. Now the output type will determine whether it's easier to steal the model or it's harder, but it's still possible. These two, these two papers up here explain it. But when it's easier, can anyone intuitively guess when it would be easier to copy a model if they gave you an API? Exactly. If they give you the exact confidence levels for all the different classes output, then you can copy their class a lot faster. Now, 
there was a paper from Hinton on distillation, where basically you could take a larger network and shrink it down by training the smaller network on the output of the larger network. So basically, if the larger network had a bunch of classification outputs, normally when you train a network, you're training it for the classification that it's supposed to be to be one and everything else to be zero. But with distillation, what you're doing is you're training the smaller network on the output classifications of the bigger network. So if the bigger network said it's 87% this and 7% this and 2% this and 1% this and point something, then what you're doing is you're training the smaller network not on 1, 0, 0, 0. You're training it on 87% this, 5% this, 7%, you know. And what they found is that a smaller network can learn to be just as accurate as a bigger network when trained in this manner. So you could use the same technique to basically copy a network and have it have the same similar accuracy of the network you're attacking through distillation. So that's one technique. And there's also an equation solving technique, which has a lot more complicated math to explain. But there's a paper by uh, Stealing Machine Learning Models via Prediction APIs by, I think it's Trammer. And um, they explain how basically with just d number of queries, d plus 1, you can basically figure out the, the weights of a neural network and um, basically know what the neural network is doing. Now, you don't have everything. So you may have the weights, but you don't have the hyperparameters, right? You don't have the, the learning rate. You don't have um, what percentage dropout. You might not have um, if they're using dropout, or you don't know if they're using the atom optimizer or RMS prop or you know uh, vanilla momentum or whatever. But um, there's another paper that actually creates surrogate models of the target model and looks. It creates data that when it outputs a certain classification indicates whether certain features are used like dropout or RMS prop or a particular optimis optimization technique. So even those can be figured out with enough queries. But they do require a lot of queries. So again, when you're protecting your machine learning models, you want to do what? Rate limit, exactly. All right. All right, so we're actually a little early, I'm surprised. Um, we're going to talk about direct model manipulation. So what you're seeing today is that many devices are now getting strong enough and have enough processing power and memory to actually do the inference of the machine learning models and the algorithms on the device or at the edge, right? That's what they talk about. They talk about machine learning at the edge. So what does this mean about the models themselves that are located at the edge on these devices? How would you go and attack those directly? Anyone know? Well, okay, so you're running it on device, so that's right. So basically, you're going to go look for what? You're going to look for a way to modify the model directly on the device to have it output whatever you want it to output, or basically to learn it, to steal it, to do whatever, all these things, to Trojan it, all this stuff we've been talking about. So basically, they'll put it on a phone, and they'll put it in a directory that has public access. Or they'll put it on a device where you plug in your USB to it, and you can get it, right? It's, it's on a shared folder or something on, on the device. So you have to keep in mind that as well, when you're trying to secure machine learning, you got to keep in mind where it's deployed and how you're going to secure that environment as well from physical attacks. Okay, now that machine learning is moving to the edge. All right? All right. Um, in summary, 
you basically don't want to trust a lot of really sensitive security related stuff to machine learning. It's not really something that's well understood in terms of robustness even. So, um, you know, a lot of times people will come up with defenses and I'm always skeptical because I'm waiting for Carlini and Wagner just to blow them away. Um, but, you know, if you must, you know, lock down, monitor, validate, version, everything. And you need to let people who are going to be responsible for this product to know what the risks are. And you want to keep up with the research, which is a lot. I mean, it's growing all the time. There are just papers and papers coming out. So you got to learn to love the math and read the papers and uh, kind of know what you're getting into. Any questions? Um, I do have references throughout the papers, throughout the slides, and uh, we'll be giving the slides out so that you can review it if you want when you get um, time to review the papers. Are there any questions? Because I, yes. So you're right, this is very academic, a lot of these, and um, it's only a matter of time. So the reason why you haven't seen a lot of this out in the real world is because one, the machine learning models are still getting deployed, and people, the hackers, need time to learn the math and to basically read these papers to understand and look through the, the source code that the papers provide on how to implement the attacks and learn and basically uh, write the Metasploit modules and you know, other automated tools that make doing these type of attacks a lot easier. But right now, there is a high bar. And one of the goals that I have is to try to help the next generation of security pr professionals prepare for when machine learning is getting into everything. And it's already started. I mean, I was talking to Peter over here, and he was telling me that even in his sound systems, you know, they're incorporating machine learning. So machine learning is being incorporated in almost everything, and it's going to happen. You're going to see these attacks, and you need to prepare. Yes? Yes. Yeah, so, so the question was basically, you know, uh, in terms of adversarial samples with autonomous cars, you can put stickers on stop signs and um, turn basically a stop sign into a speed limit sign. And there are papers on it. That's a very good point. And that would be another example of an attack that could happen in the real world. Um, it would be kind of noticeable, you know, and the, and the way they do it is they basically find a pattern placed on a stop sign that would turn the stop sign into a speed limit sign. And they basically blow it up so it's exactly the, sa the shape of a stop sign, and they overlay it on the stop sign, and then they put the, they find the areas to exactly place the stickers and the colors that they need. They stick them on, and they take the, the, uh, the guide f off, and then it turns the stop sign into a speed limit sign. And that's where a real example could occur. Now, some people argue, well, if I really wanted to, I could kick the stop sign down, right? But when you kick a stop sign down and you knock it down, if you bend it or whatever, um, it's going to be more noticeable than a few black and white stickers on a stop sign, right, that turn a red stop sign into a speed limit sign. And, you know, most people don't understand adversarial attacks where if they saw the black and white stickers, because so many stop signs have stickers on them even today, they think, ah, no big deal, right? And mo a lot of people aren't driving around with autonomous cars yet that fully um, take them around stop signs. But it's a matter of time. In the next 10, 15 years, we might have a situation where 
this could be a very big problem because of the fact that everyone's using autonomous cars. No one's looking up at stop signs and, you know. Yes? Oh, no, no, okay, so the image patching is different from the stop sign example. That's an... Well, it, it's a little different. So the, the adversarial patching is where basically we've created a patch that overrides the classification for everything. In the, in the stop sign example, they specifically figured out what adversarial perturbations they would have to apply to a stop sign to turn it into a speed limit. And so they figure out what areas of the stop sign, and they blow it up and then overlay the, the, f the filter on the real stop sign with the cutouts where they need to stick the stickers in the exact locations and then basically um, turn it into a speed limit. So it's a little different. It's a little different. Yes? That is correct, yes. So that's a very good, good point. So the, 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 the gentleman was making a point that these can also be used in a positive way, and I'm doing that right now in my research. Uh, so uh, the gentleman was pointing out that they have these special glasses that you can wear that act as a adversarial input to facial, recogni <laughs> facial recognition system so that the pe person can't be identified. And in oppressive regimes... This would be a nice thing. The only thing is, those glasses are very distinct. I mean, they're like red and green and yellow, and you know, you, you pa paste them on the outside of your glass, and they're pretty thick. So if somebody in those oppressive regimes saw, saw you with one of those on, it would be kind of problematic. But what, what I'm looking at is um, using adversarial techniques to combat deep fakes. And actually, Facebook just re uh, released last week uh, affirmation to the technique that I'm using. So basically, if you think about it, you can apply adversarial perturbations to your pictures that you post on Facebook. And what will happen is if they try to use them to create deep fakes, basically you're taking the landmark positions on the face and, and using the adversarial uh, perturbations to warp them. So when they read the face and they read the adversarial locations of the corners of your mouth, the corners of your eyes, you know, the nose, everything. It's warped and it's in the wrong position. So when they actually go and map your face onto the target, the, you know, the, the corner of your mouth is, is um, you know, pulled and uh, doesn't look normal. And so you're right. You can use these techniques in a way because you're, you're basically fighting bad uses of machine learning with these adversarial te techniques. So in, in, uh, in Chinese medicine, they have this idea of using a poison to fight a poison. So it's kind of like that. But that's a, that's a, good, um, a good observation that you're making. Any other questions? And we can go back and cover any particular area that you, you know, that you feel like I need to elaborate on or that wasn't explained clearly um is there anything else yes uh, you talked about inspecting the models from a public api yes to basically look at this model but all these techniques to basically use that model to bait these adversaries that's right Okay, so the patches are of, okay, so the question was, you know, basically with adversarial examples and with patches and using the technique of having the API to copy the model, would you be able to use patches, I mean, the adversarial, would you be able to create adversarial patches because um, the gentleman thinks that it's kind of a, what you said, a specialized case of, yes, so, so the, the adversarial patch is, first of all, that, you mean, you mean the toaster thing, right? Is that what you're talking about, right? The toaster? Okay, so 
The toaster is a very specific case where you can only use it with single object classifiers. And the other thing is when you, it, it might be the case where that, it might be difficult to create a patch um, because you're, I think the adversarial patch requires you to have a very fine control over the gradients. And, but the thing is, adversarial pictures or samples are different from the adversarial patch. So if you create a picture of a cat on your cloned model that gets categorized as guacamole, that's different from the toaster. So the toaster, you're dealing with creating this representation that's like a high representation of your training data, right? It has basically different features from your training data for that class that are all combined into this one patch. But if you're creating an adversarial sample or example, what you're doing is you have a picture and you're perturbing it such that it gets classified as a target class. So that's different. And that, they've already shown, is transferable and will work successfully with the techniques I've been showing you with using the API to create your own model, a copy, and then use that model to generate these adversarial samples. So that works. But what you talked about with the patch, you know, that toaster thing, I don't know if they've really done any testing with the transferability of that. I think um, that particular example is more for the insider threat case. Yes, in the back. Would it be possible to train the network to detect? Okay, so, yeah, so, okay, so um, there are papers that talk about that. Okay, so the question was, is it possible to write, I mean, to have a machine learning model that detects adversarial inputs? Is that correctly? Am I rewording that correctly? Okay, so there are papers that are trying, you know, but... Um, so it's, it's kind of this problem where you have, you know, when we go back, if we go back to that picture of a neural network, right? The, the key thing that you need to understand, okay, just, let, yeah, let's just use this picture at the top right. Um, first of all, th that's kind of what I was trying to do in the beginning is um, detect them, but it's, really difficult because if you look at what is a cat, right? Basically, if you run a real cat through this neural network model, each one of these rows is a sequence of numbers, right? And for a cat, you're going to have a certain number of rows in the first, a certain number of, a certain sequence of rows. Like think of each of those dots as like an element in an array of numbers that represents a cat. Okay, so the first layer will have number, you know, two in the first one, 1.5, 1.1, 3.7, 7.7, 8 point something, right? And then the next layer will have a different set of numbers. So the problem is that when you create your adversarial input, as long as you can get your input to produce any of the same numbers in the columns as cat, you win, right? Because as soon as you get to one of the layers being cat, everything after that is cat, right? Because it's just doing this, the weights are, are fixed, and it's, it's doing this, this set of linear operations with, through an activation function throughout the whole network, and that becomes cat, right? And you can see there's so many different ways you can vary that... You know, you can make your input not be cat in the first column, not be cat in the second, but boom, it's cat on the third. 
And boom, because it's cat on the third, it gets to be cat on the output, right? Or you can make your input such that the first blue column is not cat, but the second column has all the numbers that are cat. And then because they're all the numbers that are cat, when it goes through and multiplies by the weight, it becomes cat in the, the, the final layer and then becomes cat on the output, right? So it's really, you can even, for example, create random looking data that will become highly confident to cat. And so trying to consider all the different possibilities is not an easy proposition. And so um, that's why I kind of punted on it. And I said, okay, I'm not going to do the detection mechanism. I'm going to try to use the adversarial against deep fakes as a prevention, prevention mechanism. Um, it, I don't know. I mean, that one is a hard problem because it's easy to create a new adversary it's so easy to create a new adversarial example that you know goes around whatever detection me mechanism you create like some people say oh we're gonna create a you know l infinite ball around each of our training sets and you know uh, we're gonna make it size epsilon and we're gonna make sure that anything you provide us if it's in this ball it's okay, you know, if, even if you provide a perturbation, we're going to say it's cat. Or th there, there are different ways of looking at it. If it's outside or something, you know, let's, let's try to find it or something. And it's, when you're dealing with these high dimensional spaces and, you know, the fact that there's so many ways to combine these things together, it just, it's really difficult. I mean, if you think of a way, I'd, I'd be all, I'd be willing to, to listen. But good question, very good question. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for joining me today and going through this, all the math. Um, I hope you got a lot of benefit from this. Um, if you have any other questions, please uh, feel free to come up uh, and ask me um, after this, but, um, yeah, that's, I think that is basically it. Yeah.